Welcome to World of DAS, a show for data enthusiasts. I'm your host, Warren Hoffman, CEO of SafeGraph. For more conversations, videos, and transcripts, visit safegraph.com slash podcasts. Hello, fellow data nerds. My guest today is Sinan Narayal. Sinan is the Professor of Management, Marketing, IT, and Data Science at MIT. And he's the director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy and founding partner of that Manifest Capital. So then welcome to World of DAPS. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, now uh, your book, Hype Machine, is really cool. It details how like friend recommendations and feed algorithms create uh, polarization and kind of filter bubbles of information. But, you know, like, I mean, human networks, like we're all used to, we're we're kind of used to being clustered uh, with people who are similar to us. Um, and, you know, maybe these social networks are like a bit more extreme bit, bit with making like friend recommendations, et cetera. But doesn't it just mimic real life or where's the like change from real life? Well, I mean, I think that it turbocharges the human desire to associate with people like ourselves. So human social networks are well known for being homophilous, which just means that birds of a feather flock together. We tend to make friends with people who are like ourselves. But at least two things are different with algorithms mediating our social relationships. The first is that um, we are more likely to run into people that are not like ourselves out there in, in normal everyday life. So uh, in the workplace, uh, out in our communities, um, even though we tend to be homophilous even where we live, uh, if we are just going about our daily lives in our cities or we're going to you know various you know events or you know socializing with the with our the families of our kids or things like that, we're more likely to run into diversity uh, and in our workplaces. But an algorithm, if it is trained to maximize the likelihood that you accept a friend, recommendation or make a friend recommendation, it's going to really uh, hone in on recommending people that are even more like you than you would run into in normal everyday life. So it sort of turbocharges our desire to be homophilous. To and it, does, it does seem like society in the last, let's say, 40, 50 years is really moving in this direction, even without social networks, right? I mean, people are moving to areas, um, areas that were once, let's say, 60% of one party are now 80 to 90% of one party. People are subscribing to news that fits exactly what they like. This is very, very niche news that they want to hear. So they're kind of voting with their feet. They're voting with their wallet. And now they're voting with like the social media algorithm as well. Yes. And you're right. There's been a lot of books written on this realignment in terms of voting and politics where people have moved and districts have become either all Republican or all Democrat in the United States. Um, and there's been a lot written about polarization as a result as well. The, the second part of the social media world is that you can really be in a bubble that's completely blocked off from other perspectives. So it's not just that you socialize with people like yourselves, but your entire uh, stream of information becomes tailored to this type of worldview. And that's where you get into some of the dangers that are discussed in the book and elsewhere. And okay, now there are a lot of people who are kind of sounding the alarm about social media. Um, some of the, beside yourself, some of the other famous people are like Eli Pariser, uh, Tristan Harris. There's many, many others like where do you kind of differ from their thoughts? Well, so I very much respect those people and many of them are, are close friends of mine. Um, and similar to them, uh, I have experience in building these kinds of systems as an entrepreneur, as an investor, but slightly different from them uh, is my role at MIT where we do large scale peer reviewed science analyzing this data for a living. And I mean, you mentioned Eli and Tristan, you, you know, Tristan having worked at Google, Eli having built multiple companies, you know, yep. move on, Upworthy and so on. 
they have experience as doers, but neither of them are scientists uh, in the sense of doing peer-reviewed research. Are, for a are you, is there like certain conclusions that you you believe that they don't believe or they believe you don't believe? Or Yeah, I mean, we have differences in, in some of our opinions here or there. Um, but, you know, I think that the main, the main difference is uh, it, I, I sort of have a requirement of my job, which is that I have to be able to, anything I say has to get past three anonymous reviewers that all yeah, have yeah, PhDs. Yeah. And if I say something that contradicts the known science in the matter, then I'm going to be held to task for it at the next conference or the next time I'm at the water cooler with my fellow scientists. And so that forces me to hold my tongue. I can't it, you know, in my book, in the introductory chapter, I say, listen, you know, I'm going to come to some places where I'm going to stop short of making a bold claim. And that's because with my scientist hat on, I have to be very careful about the rigor and the robustness of the things that I'm saying and the conclusions that I can draw. And I hold myself to that standard because that's part of my job as a scientist. So I think that that's part of the difference. Now, I, I, I'm really fascinated with the spread and popularity on social media posts, both the misinformation, I think that's what you studied, but just like how things spread in general. Um, and, and it seems like from your, what you came up with, like the, the, the core, the core belief of how things spread fast is that they're quote unquote novel. Is that right? And like, yeah. what, what does that mean? Like if I yeah. want to just create a, a viral social media post, like what should I do? How do you break it down? Yeah. So, so the study that you're talking about is a 10 year study of the spread of false news that we conducted with Twitter and published in science in 2018. And uh, in fact, we also thought, hey, you know, maybe the reason false news spreads is because it's spread by people with more followers or people who follow more people and so on. Uh, and, and we looked at all of this and the exact opposite was true. The people, the, the people spreading false news had fewer followers, followed fewer people, were less often verified, had been on Twitter for less time and so on. So we had to seek alternative explanations for why false news was spreading. And what we found was that it was more novel in that it was different from what people had seen in the last 60 days. But when you say what is novelty, that's actually a very crudely defined concept in the science. And so we're writing a paper now uh, called Unpacking Novelty, which is about how do you define novelty? So I'll give you a couple of ways. Is it like the classic like man bites dog type of thing or? Uh, yes, in a sense. So uh, what we found was that in the false news study, the, the, the stories that were salacious, blood boiling, anger inducing and shocking, surprising. So shock and awe uh, is associated with sharing. Uh, people are 70% more likely to retweet false news. And uh, false news is significantly more novel, hadn't been seen recently, shocking, salacious, blood boiling, anger inducing, and so on. So shock and awe uh, works uh, in, in a sense on social media, which is disturbing. Um, but there aren't very good definitions of novelty. And there's a lot of ways you can look at novelty. So is it the degree to which, uh, how far away it is from topics that you already know about? Is it uh, all of the dimensions of the topic are different from what you know about? So there's a lot of different sort of technical ways to define novelty. And actually those specifics matter because it turns out that it could be that if something is novel, but too novel, then it's too far afield from what you know and not interesting. So yeah. there could be a sweet spot of novelty. We don't know yet because we haven't defined novelty rigorously enough and we haven't studied it enough yet. Do you think there could be a point where like a priori you just where, where a tweet comes in or whatever and, and it's it's a uh, sub second so it hasn't yet been seen by everyone and you think there could be some sort of prediction algorithm based on that to know like how viral it might become? Yeah, you know, there's a uh, there's always been this interest among uh, researchers about can they predict virality, and the way I look at this is that uh, hindsight is twenty twenty. So using models, we can look back at things that went right, viral that compared viral. to other things, and we right. can describe and characterize them. But it's hard to predict a priori which things are going to go viral in advance, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. 
The first is that um, they're very rare events. And so rare events are harder to predict, but that's not enough to, to prevent prediction. There are lots of rare events that we can build models of predicting rare events. But I think that while things that go viral tend to have certain characteristics, they also have tend to have other things that aren't part of that stack of things that are associated with going viral that are sort of the, the unknown quantity of them that that is that, that is part of why they go viral and each one has a different unknown quantity so there's some uh it, it's it sort of escapes us to be able to build reliable models predicting virality but it's easy for us to build models that describe you know uh in historical data can pick out the viral things from the non-viral things if that now, makes is sense. it I mean there's so many tweets you know you you could make the argument that maybe it's like the Mikey the monkeys in the typewriter and one of them creates Shakespeare or something like that is there some sort of sense like okay some are just going to go viral and we just got to throw a lot of stuff out there or yeah I mean you know I think that there are uh, there have been people who have successfully been have been better able to right. create okay. virality than others um but that doesn't mean that you could predict virality reliably yeah, yeah. now you know what is it i think that there's a combination of trial and error of throwing you know spaghetti against the wall and just you know survivor bias picking out you know this person is reliably creating viral hits but they make a thousand things one of them goes viral they make another thousand things Another one goes viral and say, wow, this guy just made two viral hits. That's pretty amazing. But you don't see the tw the 2,000 things that didn't go viral. So I think there's a lot of survivor bias in the descriptions of things or people that are successful at making things go viral. But I think that, that once you land on something, uh, you try it again, you, you tweak it and so on. So I don't think that virality is a science. I think that we can describe it in hindsight. We're not very good at predicting it in the future. Now um, you know, if you think of like social media news versus TV news, you know, it, it, you know my, my unscientific study of TV news is that it's probably worse for your health than cigarettes. Um, and there's just a lot wrong with TV news. How do you, and, and, you know, at least with social media news, the, the vast majority of news is about my friend's babies and stuff, which is somewhat kind of interesting to, to the average user. Like, how do you see those two? And have you studied like the effects of TV news versus social media news? Yeah, so, and it's getting worse, right? Because I think that um, the cable news channels, at least in the United States, have sort of hit on this business model of catering to one point of view and going to the extreme and becoming more extreme in their rhetoric at that extremity, if you will. Yep. Um, and that's engaging. And, and we see this engagement model uh, being prevalent in the attention economy. The same thing happens on Facebook where engagement uh, and, is and they also they, they need to create news right so they're all they're they're that's what their business is so they constantly have to like sensationalize things that aren't really that sensational that's right you know i i i i uh i challenge you to turn on one of these channels and not see the words breaking news at the <laughs> yeah, bottom totally. of the screen breaking news is always breaking and the reason <laughs> for that is because similar to what we found in the twitter study if I can impress upon you that, wow, this is shocking, it's novel, it's, it's new. right now, it's happening, yeah. it's, it's important now, uh, that gets your attention. But, you know, as a result, breaking news is always breaking 24 hours of the day now on these cable news channels. What we say about it and what I've thought about it is that, and people say to me, you know, isn't the cable news uh, just as bad or worse for the spread of misinformation and the hyping us up of society and so on? And my answer is that there are feedback loops between all of these communication channels. So um, what is on social media then gets rebroadcast yep. by cable news and amplified. What gets seen on, on cable news then gets shared on social media. And it creates an ecosystem of rever reverberating engagement and uh, escalation, which is in, a, in and of itself a complex system that generates some of these um, uh, dynamics that we see. Yeah, even the New York Times, which, you know, historically has been um, one of the most uh, venerated news organizations, just the last few years just has, um, you know, they, they have a business model now of catering to a, to a core group of subscribers. 
And they, a lot of their stories are just quoting things from Twitter. Um, and it, it, seem, it does seem like we're, as a society, is there any way to break out of this thing in society? It does seem in society we're moving into this uh, 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 more polarized uh, news sources. Yeah. You know, I mean, in my book, I describe four levers that we have to sort of break out of this. And I think this has to do with the larger attention economy that we've built uh, for ourselves. And the, the engine of that attention economy being this sort of engagement model that hyper uh, engages us or tries to hype us up. That's why the book is called The Hype Machine. And I think that there are four levers, which I call money, code, norms, and laws, where money is super important is the business models, which create the incentives for all the actors and stakeholders in this, in this engagement economy. Um, code is the design of the platforms and the algorithms and the systems. Uh, norms is how we adopt and use the technology. So what we say, uh, whether we're paying attention to how we get hyped up or engaged, uh, and then uh, laws is obviously regulation. We've got a lot of work to do uh, in terms of ensuring competition. Right now, uh, there's no competition in the social media economy. And we'll get into that perhaps. Uh, without competition, these platforms make money hand over fist. Same with the cable news channels. They have no incentive to change or uh, fix some of the things that we all know are wrong with them. We also have to worry about the balance between free speech and harmful speech and so on. We don't have a handle on much of this at the current moment, but we need all four of those levers, money, code, norms, and laws, rowing in the same direction if we hope to break out of this as you're- Let's get, let's get into the competition because yeah. that, that's very newsworthy right now as well. And, yeah. and I know that you mentioned that breaking up companies won't solve like the market failures in social media and you, I think you're, uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but but you you believe that instead we need th reforms like interoperability, data portability to create competition. Why will that work better than breaking these companies up? Well, you know, breaking a company up is very sensational and newsworthy. Um, and when, when you mention words like interoperability and data portability, it's very nerdy, technical, and everybody goes to sleep. But... I'm not against breaking a company up, but what we need is that's a Band-Aid on a tumor. We need much more structural solutions if we hope to have sustainable competition in the long term. So let me try to explain interoperability in a way that uh, makes sense, which is that the social media economy runs on network effects, which means that each of these platforms, uh, the, its power and its ability to attract users and retain users is a function of its size. The way that network effects work is that I can keep people on my platform if access to the people on that platform is only on my platform. So if you want to talk to your Facebook friends, you have to be on Facebook. That's how Facebook keeps users there. If you want to talk to your friends and family, you got to be on Facebook. Yeah, or even iMessage. Or yeah. iMessage. Yeah. Any of these closed walled gardens and the reason why they're closed and walled gardens is because these companies know that if they can close them off, they get a lot of value from the fact that they already have a lot of users and people will want to join and will not leave because they want access to all those people that they've got locked in this walled garden. Yep. Now, interoperability breaks that and makes the new innovative company that comes online able to connect with those 3 billion people on Facebook. And when you legislate and force interoperability, it enables innovation and competition sustainably for the long term because new entrants can come in and plug right into that network effect. Yeah, so like when Gmail started, obviously email is completely interoperable. Um, and so they could just plug on this already existing email system. Everyone already used email to, uh, to communicate. Gmail was a significantly better system than what already existed. And then everyone could move there. Whereas like if, if you already had this like internal network on Yahoo Mail, you, you would be very reluctant to move over to Gmail, even if the product was better. Perfect example. Could you imagine if you as a user of Gmail could only email other Gmail users? You tear your hair out and you go crazy thinking, yeah. wow, that is insane. Imagine if you could only SMS text message from Verizon to other Verizon customers or from Sprint to other Sprint customers. You'd think that's crazy, but that's exactly what we have in social media today, which I think is crazy. So 
As a condition of the AOL Time Warner merger, we forced the AIM Instant Messenger to become interoperable with Yahoo Messenger and MSN Messenger. Before we did, it had 65% market share. One year later, it had 59%. Two years later, it had 55%. And three years later, it seeded the entire market to new entrants. That's what interoperability does to competition in a market. So we have this new chair of the FTC, um, Lena Khan, and um, and she's written a lot about monopolies. And she, she seems to be a little bit more on the breakup side of things. Some of them, I think, may, some of these big tech companies, maybe there are clear lines on how you break them up. Amazon, it has AWS, it has the store, and maybe it has Twitch or something. Other of the big companies like Apple, there's no line about how you would even, I don't even know how you would break it up if you wanted to break it up. So it's it, there doesn't seem like any other recourse except interoperability. And by the way, does interoperability also include um, like allowing more people access to app stores and uh, like some sort of pricing controls? Or how do you think about some of these other types of things? Well, I think the other major issue right now is, as Elizabeth Warren has said, this idea that you can't be the umpire and a team in the same game. And yep, that's yep. the idea of Amazon controlling the marketplace for products and then selling its own basic Amazon basic products in that marketplace. And then privileging those products in the search results or in, in collecting data on all the choices that are made to privilege its own products. That's a separate sort of regulatory issue. But in my mind, all of these issues uh, need structural reforms to the economy itself. A breakup of a company doesn't prevent the next company from yep. doing that same thing. You need a law that says you can't be the owner operator of the marketplace and have your own products there if that is the type of competition that you want to create. Europe is ahead of the us on the structural reforms that generate competition um, with the Digital Services Act uh, and the Digital Markets Act. Um, we need and there, similar a, reforms. And, and, and can describe this a little bit because one of these I know where you can, um, they're really forcing banks to make sure that your financial data is interoperable. You can move your data between one to the other. You can aggregate your data. Um, you know, for new services, et cetera. Is that, is that what you mean by this yes. kind of interoperability? Yes. So the European regulations specify um, a lot of restrictions on what they call gatekeepers, which are uh, these sort of big companies in a space that either dominate the marketplace or set the rules of the marketplace. And there are a number of different uh, elements to those two new uh, forthcoming regulations that are about um, you know, limiting the or or uh, sort of controlling the way that these gatekeepers operate in a marketplace. And that is the type of thing that leads to sustainable competition because it applies not just to the current market leader, but anybody that comes after that market leader and the rules of the road for how business is done in that ecosystem. Again, I'm not against the breakup of any particular company. I just don't think that that is going to create sustainable competition. I also think, by the way, with the case of Facebook, that that antitrust uh, case, the breakup Facebook case, faces a very uphill battle. It's going to be 10 years. It's going to yep. be slow and laborious. And also, the lines are really just WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook, right? That's I right. Mean, you know, it's not that you, you have limited lines. Now, how did, like, in Europe, you know, Google has a higher market share in Europe than it does in the U.S. Facebook has higher market share in many European countries than it does in the U.S. So it does seem like there's still a lot of, um, you know, there's still a lot of concentration of power in Europe as well. Well, Europe is just beginning down this road with the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. So what what is to come in terms so we'll of see what happens? We'll see what happens. Okay. Exactly. I just think that that's the better approach is to have structural reforms of the economy itself rather than uh, dismantling one company and thinking that that's just going to change the market economics of the of the market itself. OK, now going back to the spread of misinformation, I'm. Part of the reason it seems is that there, there's just this like general distrust of experts globally. Um, and you know, it, uh, some of that mistrust, maybe quite a lot of that mistrust is, is actually quite justified. Um, you know, um, um, what is the expert class broadly? I don't know how you define that. What does the expert class need to do to, to better engender the trust? 
That's a good question. I mean, I think that uh, it's a shame because a lot of times these experts have spent uh, years, decades trying to understand the specific, very specific problems that they're focused on. And to disregard them, I think we do that as a society at our peril. But I also think that uh, it's uh, understandable in a sense because of a couple of reasons. One is that I think that the experts need to be more transparent. Um, right now, I think that they just, you know, uh, speak in a way that says, here's the answer. I'm the expert and you should just yep. take it as the I've answer. I've got a white lab coat. I'm the, right. I'm the one. Right. Okay. Yeah. So transparency, you know, uh, just don't assume, uh, you know, a large swaths of the population, if you uh, speak in, in accessible language, are smart enough to understand uh, what you're saying and can get it. So don't, you know, uh, don't sort of shroud yourself in the white lab coat and, and, uh, and, and say, hey, I'm the expert and that's the, that's the answer, that, that's the path that we should follow. So transparency is one. The other thing is that I do think that uh, sometimes experts, having spent so much time thinking about something or researching something or focusing on something, assume uh, that the audience is not capable. And so not only talks down to them, but also um, doesn't, uh, doesn't give them the benefit of the doubt to explain and assume that they can engage and and consume and understand and react and, and participate in the conversation. I think that's a big miss on the part of the experts because um, you know I think when you talk to more people, uh, you learn yourself. So if you are open to learning, uh, you can learn in sometimes the most um, unexpected ways and in some of the most unexpected conversations and uh, openness, transparency, and not sort of talking down or assuming um, that your counterpart is unable to understand what you're saying. I think that's where experts are going wrong today. There also seems to be a lot of pressure on scientists to kind of like change their work at least a little bit to kind of conform to a particular narrative. Now, I don't know enough historically to know if this is a new thing or if this is an always type of thing, but I have many friends that are scientists that um, have had a lot of pressure. One of my friends is a cancer scientist um, and um, is very against smoking, but did a study that um, that in this particular study showed that people who uh, smoked at older ages didn't weren't at higher risk of cancer. Um, and he didn't like the results of the study, but wa still wanted to publish the study. Um, but he got a lot of pressure from his colleagues in his community not to publish the study because they said, well, okay, this is going to hurt the overall um, narrative of what we're of what we want to do. How do you how do you see these um, pressures on scientists coming to bear? Well, it's interesting because, you know, uh, I think scientists are also a communal uh, species in a sense. They are they live in a social environment and uh, they are very much um, subject to the opinions of others. Um, but at the same time, I think scientists are genuinely skeptical people uh, and that cuts both ways. So if you have a, 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 an overwhelming set of results that go in one direction and then you have a study that in a, in a certain narrow niche area goes against that, um, they're going to be skeptical of it. If, if something is a new discovery, uh, it's initially met with traditionally a lot of skepticism. So yep. I think that this skepticism is valid. It's kind but of I like, also, um, you know, like uh, moving the wag, covering the wagons and everything like that, putting them together and, and, uh, and well, getting together. No, I don't. I don't think it's 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 sort of scientists circling the wagons and saying we need to defend the narrative that exists currently or anything like that. I think it's sort of if you're an individual scientist and you've seen a thousand papers that say that smoking causes cancer, and then you see one that says it doesn't, you're naturally thinking, wait a minute, let me read that with more care. Yep, like, yep, what yep. what did they do wrong? Because I mean, these thousand papers before it yep, say the yep. opposite. How can this one be right if these thousand are wrong? And it could be right in a sense that, well, like in this age group or, yep. you know, if they only smoke menthol cigarettes or whatever it is, I mean, yep, I don't yep. know the study, it could be right, but there's a natural skepticism that some paper that goes against the weight of, you know, thousands of papers before it, 
a simpler explanation is that they did something wrong <laughs> than, than they discovered something new. So, uh, you know, I think that that skepticism is really important to science because it forces us to be rigorous and really show things that are robust and hang our hats on things that are robust. But um, it can also create knee-jerk reactions uh, to new things as well. There's a, there's a famous saying, by the way, that, that is that science advances one funeral at a time. Or as a Neil, Niels Bohr, right? Right. <laughs> yeah, I love that saying. Yeah. Um, okay, now you and I um, share um, what maybe possibly is an unhealthy obsession with Wall Street bets. Right. So I'd love to just jump jump into that rat hole sure. a little bit. Now there's like there's all these like new subreddits that are gaining popularity um, on on kind of stock picking, stock memes, etc. W- where do you see the Wall Street bets movement going in the future? Well, you know, I think Wall Street bets is old hat now. All yeah, the apes, yeah, all the apes have left that forest and uh, they've dispersed to other places, right? They call themselves apes, so that's not my own pejorative term. Um, so, you know, I think that what we saw is online collective crowds successfully exercise uh, collective behavior coordination. Yep. And I think that that means once that was demonstrated to be effective, I don't think it's going anywhere. In other words, I don't see it fizzling out uh, in the sense that I think that it will continue. It will disperse into new channels. It's unclear to me where the new subreddits are going to be or which new social media platforms it's going to appear on or where it's going to in the same way that it's hard to predict virality, it's hard to predict where the next successful group of uh, you know, uh, those talking about equity prices is going to go. But I think it's going to evolve. And, I, and part of the reason I think it's going to evolve is that I think that institutional investors are going to uh, take it more seriously, insert themselves into the conversation, maybe surreptitiously, maybe not. Um, uh, almost certainly they're already in that conversation. Already. Right? Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. hundred percent. That's true. At the very least they're uh, monitoring know, that and trading on 100%. it and either, either trading against it or adding fuel to the fire. Right. Uh, when these big exactly. hedge funds go down, it's often there are, it's not just the crowds. There are other hedge funds helping those other, help, helping the hedge funds go down essentially. They're helping the crowds. That's right. That's exactly right. And it's, uh, you know, when one when one hedge fund goes down, there's a larger hedge fund that makes triple on that bet going yeah, in the opposite right. direction. Right. So, yeah. So it's I, I just I think that we have to recognize this as an addition to the uh, equity market landscape that will evolve and change over time, will be co-opted in ways by institutional investors, will not in other ways. It's hard to know exactly where it's going to show up. But this is a a part of our investing reality going forward. Uh, And I've been saying that um, since before GameStop. In fact, I talked about this in my book, which was published in September 2020. uh, And I used multiple examples of uh, social media driving equity prices and sort of laid out the research on it. And I said that this is going to become more of a of a part of our investing ecosystem in the future, and then obviously when GameStop hit, uh, people turned to me and said, "Wait, didn't you say this in your book?" And I said, <laughs> "Yes," you know. And they said, "Well, what is going on here?" And I said, "Well, I don't consider myself uh, a, an oracle. This is entirely predictable if you study social media because it enables this type of information flow coordination, and that's exactly what an equity market is, uh, and so." I think it's part of our landscape and it will evolve and and uh, it will be part of our landscape for, for many years to come. Now, if I'm, if I'm a, um, a hedge fund or something, um, what I really want to do is there's all these different people essentially putting out, uh, they're trying, there's all these different people trying to coordinate uh, certain equities um, to go up. And what I want to do is figure out early on in the coordination, which ones are going to work, bet heavily on those. Um, and not um, not bet on the ones that are not going to work. Um, you know, with, for every GameStop and AMC, et cetera, there are uh, potentially hundreds of equities that people tried to coordinate but didn't actually take off, 
right? Um, how would you advise if you were an advisor to a hedge fund, how would you advise them like going in and trying to understand this as early as possible? Well, it's interesting you say that because I'm working on this exact problem right now. I find this fascinating. Uh, and it's it's such a, an interesting problem of collective behavior. Um, and, and part of what makes it interesting is that uh, a lot is at stake. And so people behaving and making decisions in this in this particular um, uh, sphere are putting their money on the line, their, their mortgages, their houses, and so on on the line. Um, and so that changes the way decision-making happens in these collective uh, situations. So I think there are ways to be better at predicting uh, uh, these types of events. I don't wanna to reveal too much of the, the, the secret sauce, if you okay. will. But I think that uh, a number of things can help. So for instance, um, diversification of your bets obviously is important. Uh, building ensemble models, I think, is important uh, instead of relying on a single type of model, which is more fragile. Um, and I think that uh, data is always the key, as you know, uh, in your line of business. In my mind, rough estimate, um, the success of a model is 80% uh, or more due to the quality of the data and the way that you organize that data. And less than 20% is about the model itself. Uh, you can use a very rudimentary workhorse model, but all of the work is in what we call feature engineering. And feature engineering is something that uh, is is sort of doesn't get enough attention as being relative to the source of value that it creates in predictive models. Right. It's the data munging. It's the data cleaning. It's the truthiness of the data. It's how easy it is to ingest into your systems. Um, and I would add one. I would add one other thing, which is the the identification and extraction of features from the data. Features being a definable data element from a large swath of data. Like I could take a, a, a data set of um, whatever, sales of products, uh, and I can slice that and dice that an infinite number of ways. For instance, what's the variance of the sales? What's the second order variance of the sales? Yep. What's the temporal dynamics of the sales? What's the variance of the temporal dynamics of the sales? What are the correlations between this subset and that subset yep. and the subsets of subsets and so on? It's the infinite ways to slice the data, which give you features that then can be predictive. And that's why I always say that data science and analytics is essentially a creative art because you have to be thoughtful and creative about new insights of how what the data are and how that data can, can generate value. And that's where I think the best data scientists separate themselves from the pack is in that ability to ask the right questions and an ability to be creative about the data. Those two things are, are undervalued, but essential in my mind. Interesting. We had a, we did a podcast with Hillary Mason, yeah. um, and she said almost something ver verbatim to what you just said. Re really, really fascinating. That's no and surprise because we're good friends and we talk <laughs> a lot. So, as as the homophily effect, right? Um, she also now, loves cheeseburgers. <laughs> now, you um, speaking of data, I mean, you, you're also well known for using lots of different types of data. Um, I think you you and I kind of came across each other when you used the SafeGraph data a year ago for COVID modeling. Used a lot of other types of data. Um, how how can how, how do you think companies or what obligations do you think companies and organizations should have? to making their data available for researchers and academics? Uh, you know, as a researcher and an academic, I think they should really make all of their data available to researchers and academics for, uh, for research purposes. Um, I say that a little tongue in cheek. I think that there are some uh, companies where we absolutely need more transparency because they're having such an important effect on society. Yep. This is uh, certainly true in social media, and I've made this point over and over again. I've, I've spoken recently to Nick Clegg and had this conversation about how we have to become more transparent yep. 
with social media. We have to understand. For those who don't know, Nick Clegg uh, runs policy at Facebook. Right. Exactly. And and he agrees, but I think that there's also some sort of uh, restraints on their ability to do that and so on. So I think a good example is, um, you know, what they cite is, well, we also are being pressured to uh, focus on privacy and the security of the data of individual users of Facebook. And this is something I pointed out in, a, uh, in an interview with uh, MIT Tech Review in 2018, which I call the, te- uh, the transparency paradox. We want these companies to be more transparent, but we're simultaneously asking them to be more private and secure with our data, which makes it hard for them to give out data. Remember, Cambridge Analytica scandal began with a release of data to a researcher mm-hmm. from Facebook, right? And then used for purposes that it wasn't intended to be used for originally. Uh, And so we have to develop um, new methods for enabling transparency and privacy and security at the same time. Like a home morphic encryption or some other type of- Differential privacy. privacy. Yeah, exactly. So those types of methods will help us be more transparent and secure at the same time. Uh, And then we need more ability to analyze this kind of data. So we need more transparency. We need more access uh, to researchers. We can have data safe harbors. Uh, Social Science One is a good example uh, where industry academic consortia are trying to create safe harbors for data where scientists can analyze that data under certain uh, um, guidelines and restrictions. For instance, you know, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other types of national data holders um, will, uh, or the census uh, will allow researchers to become, in a sense, certified uh, by the census or the BLS and then go into sort of their own facility, like a clean room and analyze data within that space, but not be able to take data out. Now, how do do we, for, for things like that, like really good government data, um, there, there does seem like for researchers a little bit of a have and have not. You're at MIT, so you know you're probably much more likely to get access to really good data sets than maybe somebody who's at a less well-known institution. If you think of like Rod Chetty, like he's got access to the IRS data. He's probably produced more interesting papers on that that data set than almost anybody because the data is so valuable. But in some ways, like it's it's a little bit unfair that he has this like amazing proprietary access, but like the random economist somewhere else like can't get access to something like that. Like, how do we also democratize that access amongst the academia class? I think that's true. I, I, mean, I think Raj is amazing, and I've been speaking to him a lot over the last two years. Um, I think that standardization is a good way to do that. So when you have rules uh, and guidelines for how data can be accessed, then any credentialed academic should be able to have access to that data. A lot of times there is a bit of a subjective evaluation of particular research projects for which data is released. Yep. And you know it's not necessarily the case that uh, the privileged institutions have access. It's just correlated with being in a privileged institution that the research proposal that's made is a good one. A good way to deal with that and the way that scientists typically deal with that is blinded peer review. So instead of knowing what the institution is and who the person is, you judge the idea on its merits without Uh, while blinding. And that might enable more access and democratization of access. Um, But you also don't want research to be done uh, on, um, you know, on topics that aren't worthwhile and or topics that have themselves dangerous to them or used in nefarious ways. And so credentialing is also important. So there are a number of different elements working simultaneously there. It's been like 20 years ago now, where you're really one of the first people to pay like attention and study social media. Um, what advice would you give to like the upcoming academic, the upcoming person who really cares about studying technology? Is it just like go with your gut? I mean, you, you were doing things back then that now are super popular, but back then were not popular at all. Well, you know, I think that there is uh, there's at least two ways to think about how to make contributions in science. And I've done both. One is to sort of uh, put bricks in walls that already exist. And another one is to put a brick down in the hopes that there will be a wall there where the risk is that your brick will be the lone brick by itself with no wall being built around it. Um, I do both because I think that 
incremental science is important and making refinement, especially where you think that something is going in the wrong direction uh, or needs refinement or there are mistakes being made or we don't know enough or something, incremental things are, are useful. But I also think that uh, the advice I would give to a young scientist is don't be afraid to, to try and start a new wall. Don't be, be afraid to try and uh, ask a question that isn't being asked currently, because that's really where the big breakthroughs come from. That's really where the new insights come from and the new fields. Should are I developed. be doing like 80% on the old wall and 20% on the new wall? Or how do you should you think about your out your portfolio allocation? Yeah, that portfolio allocation changes over the course of a career. I do less incremental work now because I just feel freer to sort of, you know, like if if I put a brick down and nobody and people say, oh boy, that that's really boring, Sinon. I can I can sort of move on from that. As an assistant professor trying to get tenure, uh, maybe that wouldn't have been such a great idea. But now I prefer to kind of like write a paper and then. Uh, hope that other people, you know, follow with more follow up research and then go on to a whole new topic and write another paper in a whole new area. That's riskier. Uh, and you're more able to take risks when you have tenure, or when you've had uh, a little bit of time under your belt doing research and so on. So I think that portfolio changes over time. But my advice would be don't, afra- don't be afraid to uh, if, if your gut is telling you that something is going to be really important and you've sort of double checked yourself in a sense, you, you've done some reality checks, you've talked to other people, you've, you know, and you have reasons for believing what you believe, you've applied a skeptical lens to your own belief that this is something important, uh, and you still believe it, go for it, because uh, there's a good chance that if uh, it pans out that it could create a whole new field, it could create a whole new area of research or a whole new uh, research question, and that's really important. We don't want all of our scientists spending 100% of their time making incremental improvements. That would be devastating to the advance of science. Yep. All right, well, last question we asked all of our guests. If you can go back in time, like what advice do you wish you could have given to your younger self? I'm finding that I'm much better at this now at my age today than I was then, but my advice would be to be more present in the moment. And I have achieved that. I'm I'm still not great at it, but I'm much better at it than I used to be. I meditate more now. I do other things that help me do this. But wherever I am, whatever moment I'm in, I am present in that moment, in that conversation. I'm listening. My mind isn't off somewhere else thinking, why is, you know, is this important to me? Is this not important to me? No. The point is you're in that moment. And the the reason I say that is because insights, friendships um, come from the least expected places. And if you're not paying attention, you're definitely going to miss it. And being present helps you fully engage yourself with the thing that you're doing in that moment and so really leverages your own capabilities to their fullest in every moment. But they also it also leaves you open to insights, new friendships, relationships, or uh, things you would have never imagined uh, coming from the most unexpected places. So uh, being present. I love that. I love that. Now, so then tell, tell us where we can find more information about you on the broader interwebs. Sure, yeah. Uh, you can find me at sinonaral.io on the web, at sinonaral on Twitter, and at Professor Sinon uh, on Instagram. Okay, awesome. And I follow you on Twitter. I, I highly recommend everyone does as well. Thank you so much for joining us on, on World of Das. Pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It was, it was fun. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed the show, consider leaving a review. For more World of Das, and that's D-A-A-S, Das, you could subscribe right here on our YouTube channel, or you could find me on Twitter at Oren, A-U-R-E-N, Oren. I'd love to hear from you.